some upcoming events here. Um, we're doing something. We've, we've been working with the uh, Southwest New Mexico Audubon Society. Um, we've done virtual picnics, not virtual picnics. We've done live <laughs> for the last <laughs> few years, and they've been very, very successful. And we want to do more and more with them. So um, the Audubon Society has been doing these birds and brews, and it was a lot of fun. It usually happened at the uh, Little Toad Brewery. And uh, so since COVID, we're, we're going to do a virtual joint GNPS and Audubon Society Trivia Night. And that's April 29th at 5.30. It'll last about an hour. And there'll be questions on animals and questions on plants. It's a very, very low key. Nobody's on the spot, uh, you know, Jackie Burton, what is the, you know, <laughs> none of that. You know, you keep your own score and then there'll be some um, prizes for um, those with the most questions answered. So anyway, a lot of fun. So please join us. It's something new. Um, and then on May 21st, we have our, actually our last program of the spring, and we'll resume our programs in October. Um, but um, Dr. Karen Blissard is going to do a uh, introduction to liverworts in New Mexico. And Karen is one of two experts on liverworts in New Mexico. She and her friend build themselves as the liverwort queens of New Mexico. And uh, it'll be fascinating. This, uh, what many people see is this lonely plant. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so stay tuned for that. Please, we've got a Gila Native Plant Society has a Facebook page, Gila Native Plant Society on Facebook. Please go and like us. And um, we've, we're, we're trying to put up photographs of <laughs> wildflower hikes, et cetera. So, uh, and then uh, if you'd like to see our, on our website at gilanps.org, one of the highlights that's a recent highlight is the fact that we now have our landscaping with native plants course fully, our online course fully on our website. You can get that whole course, it's wonderful. So please take advantage of that. All right, now. That might be interesting. Online. Go ahead, Beth, and uh, put up your slide. Okay. Uh, um. <clears throat> Looks beautiful, thank you. So Beth Like received her PhD in zoology from the University of Oklahoma and taught for over 30 years in the biology department at Centenary College of Louisiana. She also taught ecology for many years at the Central Michigan University Biological Station on Beaver Island, Michigan, and continues to participate in several ongoing research projects on the island during the summer months. Please welcome Dr. Beth Like. <laughs> I'm not used to being introduced as doctor anymore. I prefer it that way too, <laughs> not to be introduced that way. Uh, am I fine on sound and everything then? I'm okay? Okay. Uh, I'll be talking tonight then about the ecology of a desert blooming cactus, Pineocerius gregii, a uh, variety gregii in New Mexico. And so let's just go ahead and get started then here. Um, Pityocereus is a genus of cactus, and of course, most of you probably know that cacti are in the family Cactaceae. It's got lots of common names. One of his night blooming Sirius, Queen of the Night, Freda de la Noche in Spanish, uh, plus many other names that often are shared by other plants, which is the problem with common names, as you all know. There are approximately 18 species of Pityocereus. They're found in the southwestern United States and Mexico. And the name translates into kind of what it sounds like, penis candle or penis column, depending on how you want to look at that. There are three species um, divided into varieties, or actually should, there's two species and three varieties in the United States here. 
The one that I'll be talking about tonight is Canoe Series Gregii, Variety Gregii. It's got a Chihuahuan Desert distribution, so that means it's found here in New Mexico. And it's named for Josiah Gregg, who was an 1800s naturalist, did a lot of work on plants, who's, but he's probably best known for being one of the few naturalists in the United States who have ever died by falling off their horse. Uh, the, another species is Canisius gregii, variety transmontanus. That is a Sonoran desert distribution. So that's across the, to the west of us in uh, Arizona. And then a separate species, Pinocerus striatus, which has a very narrow distribution. It's found on the border of southwestern Arizona with Sonora, particularly at the Oregon Pipe Ca uh, Cactus National Monument. That is the center of its distribution. And so those are the species that we find here in the United States. As far as the description of the cactus goes, I just give a brief one. You can see from the picture over here what it looks like. It's a very slender cactus. It has about four to six ribs. The ribs are the uh, raised parts of a cactus that you can see along here. And the ribs contain white areoles. Those are the little white dots you see along the edge there. Uh, and the areoles contain the spines. And even though the spines are very short on the Pidiocereus species, they can pack a pretty good wallop when you touch them. The plant varies in color then from gray green to this purple red color that you see here, probably depending mostly on sunlight and moisture and other various physical factors in the environment. This is the distribution then of Pidiocereus gregii, variety gregii. You can see that in New Mexico, it's found in the five southwestern counties down here. Now, even though Grant County is listed here, it would not be up here in Silver City. We're talking about the more desert areas then of all of these counties. In Arizona, it's found along the southern tier of counties, and it's found in extreme west Texas. So that would be its general distribution here. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw Jim McGrath's presentation in March, but I'm going to steal a bunch of stuff from him on this slide right here. He was talking about the uh, New Mexico rare plant database, and he uh, gave a very nice slide on the definition of a rare plant, what it's based on. So I'm just repeating what he said last month. Uh, the, uh, the, the state definition of a rare plant will be based on a plant's range, whether it's narrow or wide, on its population size, whether it's small or large, and its habitat, or whether it's restricted or wide, and its vulnerability, whether or not it experiences any threats or is there is an absence of threats on the plant. And he used uh, Pidiocereus gregii variety gregii as his example. So I'm just repeating this again. It is located on the New Mexico rare plant list because of the following features. Wide range. Well, that doesn't sound like anything that's going to put it on a rare plant list. And it's not. It has a relatively broad habitat. But, um, and, and it's locally common. It has what we call a patchy distribution, meaning that you find small populations and then there'll be a big gap before you find no populations and you'll find a population again. They're in patches then. The major reason it's on the rare plant list is because it's very vulnerable to collecting. That is the major reason it's sitting there then on that particular list. Now, uh, Jim also showed us this, this slide last week, and uh, he said he didn't have time to go through the, all these abbreviations here. Uh, so I'm taking tonight to go through some of those abbreviations that we have here. Um, you can notice he's added one more common name to a deerhorn cactus. I don't think I've ever heard it called that, but I assume it must be called that other places. So if you go down to these lists here, you notice that it has an agency status. The state of New Mexico considers the plant to be endangered. That's what the E stands for. The BLM considers the plant to be sensitive on its property. The state rank is S3. S is referring to state. And if the state rank is vulnerable, the three indicates that it is a vulnerable plant. The global rank is a bunch of letters and numbers. But if you read the G3 and G4 together, globe, G for global, then that means that it is vulnerable to apparently secure. They give it a range rather than one particular value. And then the T3 is the intraspecific taxon, which is just the same thing as saying the variety. And that indicates it is vulnerable. R means it's on the New Mexico Rare Plant Technical Council list, which uh, Jim talked about last week. And then 
SS means that it is part of the New Mexico rare plant conservation strategy species, which he also mentioned last week. On this lower level down here, you can see that the state considers it under-conserved. It considers its threats to be collection, which I just mentioned, lagomorphs, which means rabbits, and cactus borers, which you've actually never seen in our area, but, but they must be a problem in some others. And the actions that are needed are population trend monitoring and threat impacts. Um, misspelled there, but that's okay. Uh, and so that's going to be some of the data that I'll be talking about tonight will be some of these population trend monitoring that we've been able to do over the years. Okay, our study began in 2012, and we have a study site located in Hidalgo County here, six miles south, southeast of Rodeo, New Mexico. So there's Rodeo, put the, the, the study site right about down there. And if you know the area, the Peloncillo Mountains right along the east side of that valley. So the study site was uh, against the Peloncillo Mountains on the west facing slope. So you're looking kind of at the study site here then against these mountains right here. This is the habitat for the plant in Hidalgo County, at least where we were. Uh, we, you're opposite the Chiricahua Mountains and over there in Arizona. This happens to be an area where there is no creosote bush, but it's still pretty typical Chihuahuan desert scrub throughout this area there. So a lot of shrub species uh, that I'll talk a little bit about later, but actually no creosote bush in the area. The plants are very cryptic. Um, I challenge you to find the plants in this photo. And right, so it's, it's Zoom and I can't do anything about it. I will point them out. There's one right here. And there's another one right there. So they hide very well. Uh, in spite of, the of that, they're easiest found, I think, in the late, the late fall to early spring when the mesquite, which is a very common shrub out there, is leafless. So we did most of our hunting for them at that time of year. When a plant was found, we recorded its GPS coordinates, the height of the plant in meters, the number of live stems, these plants are known for having a mixture of both dead stems and live stems, so you kind of got to look for just the live stems. What substrate the plant was growing in, whether it was rock, gravel, or sand. A plant species association, which means what other plants do you find that Pineocereus with? Is it, is it located beside or in another plant? The direction from the associated plant species, north, south, east, west, middle, wherever. And then we placed a cairn by the plant so that in addition to the GPS coordinates, we could refine the plant again pretty easily. Later, we had some data that we recorded on a subset of plants, which included the number of flower buds. And uh, this, the data were collected in 2013, 15, and 19. Then mortality was also recorded then in the same years, but in October rather than in May. We also did a general vegetation survey right through the Pineocereus habitat. So you see the blue line there indicates roughly where we did the general vegetation survey, and it was done this way. We created a transect, uh, which was centered in the distribution. And a transect is just defined as a long, continuous strip for sampling vegetation. Ours was quite long. It was 530 meters. I tried to convert everything to English units so that people might be able to relate to them. So you should have both of those, on, I hope, on every slide. Um, and then we recorded the shrub species only, just the shrub species, on two meters on either side of that longitudinal line. So kind of up and down this line like this. Uh, every, two meters roughly translates into six and a half feet. So that means we were looking at 12 to 13 feet of shrub species that on either side of this. So we just counted the number of individuals that we saw. And this kind of transect is referred to a belt transect because it has width like a belt does and length like a belt does. Sometimes when you do transects, you just count the plants that are literally touch your line. But we did this transect that involved a little more than that then. The distribution looked like this when we got done with all the GPS. We have 186 marked and measured plants to date, and uh, we occasionally find new ones. The elevational distribution then was from, uh, you can read it right there, about 1,310 feet to 1, 000, not feet, excuse me, meters, to about 1,385 meters. Uh, and they're scattered then throughout this area. 
you notice the green will be BLM land. So we have some that are on BLM land. The rest of it is private land. And I will point out that even though it's, it's very clustered in distribution, we did look in other areas for these plants. We looked up the mountain, we looked north, we looked west, we looked south. But these are pretty much where we find the plants. So this is what I mean by patchy distribution. This is a population with a patchy distribution. There's one little patch of plants right here. You can particularly see the distribution um, in a Google Earth picture. Notice that the plants are not found in the mountains, but instead are found along the, the slopes or the outwashes from the mountains, uh, which of course are known as bajadas. And so this is a good bajada right here that you can see sloping down off the Peloncillo Mountains right there. Uh, I know you'll never be able to find them. I couldn't either, but there's at least 15 plants that would be visible in this photograph if we could see them. Okay, so looking at the data then that were collected, this is a graph of the height data for the plant. We have a number of plants over on the y-axis here, the height in meters down here. And then the plants were divided into just categories. So we weren't looking at every single individual plant. So remember, this is 186 plants then. Uh, the range of plants was from a fairly small plant of 0.2 um, meters to a really large one, which was almost a meter high. And those of you know a little bit about statistics, that's not exactly what you call a normal distribution, but it's you know, not too bad. And so the average height of these plants was 0.48 meters, which is about 19 inches high or so. It's about a half a meter. That would be their average height. This plant here would be a good example then of something that was probably about a half a meter high. Live branches per plant were also recorded. This, I put this plant in to show you what I mean by live versus dead branches. This plant has two live branches. This one is a live branch. And this one is a live chewed on live branch. And many of the branches look just like that out in the wild. They're very chewed on by various, probably mostly rabbits. This would be a dead branch here, another dead branch there, another dead branch behind it. So we only recorded the live branches because they're the only ones, of course, that are going to be able to photosynthesize and do anything. Most of the plants had between one to five branches. 173 out of the 186 plants had one to five branches. So that's pretty common. A few more had six to 10, and there was one single plant that had 25 branches on it. Very, very big, healthy plant. The average number of live branches would be three then because they're very much skewed toward the lower numbers. As far as substrate types for Pitiosiris gregii, they much preferred gravel. Again, 133 plants out of 186 plants were found on gravel. This would be an example of what we consider gravel out there. There were 33 found in sand. That's pretty self-explanatory. And 20 of them were found in rock. And rock was defined as pretty solid rock or the plants were growing in crevices or something like that. And so by far the majority of plants are found in gravelly soils. As far as the vegetation goes, uh, this is kind of interesting because we did our transect first in 2013, and then we did it again just this last winter in 2021. And in 2013, we found 10 species of shrubs along the transect. I'm not going to worry about the numbers of shrubs we found, but just the 10 species. And then in 2021, we actually found 15 species of shrubs, but we lost one species, and that was our cholla, was absent. Uh, there's a fungus, a black fungus that is getting on the choyas. You can even see it here in Silver City in some cases. And it appears to have done a good job of damaging or killing off a lot of the choyas in the area down there in Rodeo. So what has happened over the years is, is the species richness has increased. Richness is, just means the number of species that you find. So we have gone from 10 to 15 species. And in addition, you notice from the illustrations that the vegetation has grown considerably too. So here's a barrel cactus, barrel cactus was in Zenii. In 2013, there's the same individual then in 2021. You also notice that the shrubs here have grown up considerably then over that time. This is an area where a large ranch was broken into smaller parcels and the grazing pressure was removed from it. 
So what has happened is we've seen kind of a proliferation in both numbers of species and in the growth of the vegetation. I also have to mention the agaves down here that you don't see in the picture up there. Which is actually kind of nice to see. It's nice to see that that's happened. Now, before I go any further, a lot of the rest of the story is going to involve two of the shrubs that were measured then uh, in, our, in, in the transect and that you find all over the study site. And this is honey mesquite, mesquite, prosopis glandulosa, and the four-winged saltbush, Hplex canescens. You can tell them apart in this picture even if you can't see their leaves because the honey mesquite is much darker. The atroplex is very, very light. The saltbush is very, very light like this. But these are going to figure in the story here. Okay. So we're going to have to go through an interpretation of this graph a little bit. First of all, notice that over on the y-axis, this is the percent of plants. And what we're looking at is the plant associations that the, the, the plants that Pinocerius gregii keeps company with in the, in the, in the uh, general vegetation. The bars then will be mesquite being in the darker bars and the four-winged saltbush then being in the lighter bars. So if you take a look at this, this I'm going to go a little bit at a time. In 2013, mesquite was 65% of the vegetation measured along that transect. The transect's like a little kind of a snapshot then of what you're going to find in the environment. So we're assuming it kind of mimics the environment. And it was 65% of the vegetation. In 2021, it's 53% of the vegetation. So it dropped. We actually are losing mesquite there in terms of just the number of plants. Saltbush, on the other hand, was 29% of the vegetation along the transect in 2013, but it's 39% of the vegetation in 2021. So it has increased in amount then over that time. These bars represent then the plants that Pedioceras are associated with. And in this case, in 2013, Pinioceris was associated with 84, or 84% of the Pinioceris were associated with mesquite. And by golly, in 2021, it was almost the same percentage. 85% of them were associated with mesquite. 9% were associated with salt, saltbush in 2013, and 9% are still associated with saltbush in 2013, uh, 2021. So even though the, just the uh, percentage of saltbush versus mesquite has changed during that time period, the number of mesquites or the percentage of plants of Pitiosiris under mesquite and under saltbush has not changed at all. Um, we'll, we'll kind of get to that in a second here. I do want to point out then that uh, this doesn't add to 100. I only had to go up to 90 here because there are other shrubs that Pinioceris was associated with that I didn't talk about. And there are some Pinioceris then plants that you find out in the open that aren't associated with shrubs at all. So in case anybody was worried about the math there, I just thought I'd point that out. Looking at the direction that, that P. Gregi was, um, that, that was for the plant it was associated with, 76 of all the Pinioceris plants, we're back to number of plants now, out of 186 were found in the middle then of their associated plant. 39 were west of the plant, and you can read the other numbers going through there, but I do want to point out that 11 plants were found in the open, not associated with another plant. This could be because the plant they were associated with died, but there was no evidence of dead plants around them, so some of them had evidently just germinated there out in the open like that. So let's summarize the data that we have so far on these graphs. The average height of Pinio cereus in the study area is about half a meter. The average number of live branches would be three. 71% of the plants are found in gravel. 85% of the plants are associated with the mesquite, as you see here in this picture. 41% of the plants grow in the middle of another plant. 21% grow at the west edge of another plant, and that puts them downhill then from the plant. Uh, you can imagine seeds washing downhill or something along the lines of that. And because so many of them, 85% of them, were associated with mesquite, we say that mesquite serves as a nurse plant for Pinioceris gregii. A nurse plant is defined then as a plant that provides a microhabitat that's conducive to the germination and survival of another plant. 
Now that other plant could be the same species as the nurse plant, or it could be a different species. In this case, it's a different species. The Pityoceras gregii, the other plant, is benefiting from growing under mesquite. A nurse plant survives, uh, pr provides very cooler soils and air temperatures, in other words, shade to the plant that's growing there. It will increase the humidity, which reduces evapotranspiration from the plant, which just means it doesn't lose water out of its body. And it often provides more nutrient-rich soils. As the nurse plant uh, dies or loses leaves or the leaves fall off, the leaves that are decomposed and that adds nutrients to the soil. It also provides protection from herbivory. And it's especially important, nurse plants are especially important in xeric environments. They are very common throughout desert areas. I will point out that you do find them in other areas too, but they are particularly important in desert areas, probably because the physical factors in xeric environments are just so tough on a lot of plants. So why mesquite and not saltbush? Why do we have mesquite serving as a nurse plant more than we do saltbush? Now, at this time, saltbush is actually more common than mesquite is, but the pitiocereus that are growing are still under mesquite. Now, the first thing I want to point out is the, the, the pitiocereus seeds aren't coming out of there and going, huh, I think I want to grow under a mesquite. I need to go find one. Obviously, these seeds are being randomly distributed, but when they begin to germinate, they obviously germinate better under mesquite than they do under other plants, including saltbush. So this is obviously why we find them under mesquite, but what features do mesquite have that make it such a good nurse plant? First of all, it offers a really good protection from herbivory and trampling. Um, I don't know, I'm assuming most of you are, have had some experience with honey mesquite before. If you have not, these are the spines, these white things sticking out of that plant right there. They have very long, very vicious spines but that is great protection from herbivory. Of course, it obviously protects the mesquite plant too, as well as the cactus. Out in this study area, the plants grow very low to the ground, and so those branches can trap seeds potentially because they are on the ground. The salt bush over here is pretty much an upright plant. It doesn't really grow on the ground like that. Mesquite is deciduous. That is, it loses its leaves and it goes dormant in the winter. Atroplex, on the other hand, the salt bush, maintains its leaves year-round. What this means then is that Pineocereus is not competing for nutrients and water during the winter months. This plant is not taking up water, nor is it snarfing up nutrients. And it allows light through so Pineocereus can grow at that time. Yes, Pineocereus grows in the winter. I'll talk more about that later. Mesquite leaves then also decompose and release nutrients into the soil. Uh, salt bush will also have leaves that decompose and release nutrients into the soil, but these leaves are very, very tough and very small, and they don't decompose easily. Mesquite leaves are very, very delicate. To me, they are very thin and delicate, and they do decompose very, very easily. Also, when the mesquite is leafed out, it reduces the light um, and then it increases humidity, and it's leafed out during the hottest times of the year, so this actually improves the conditions for Pineocereus during the summertime. My contention is that mesquite might be the original nurse plant for Pineocereus because it appears to have evolved to resemble mesquite branches. This indicates kind of a co-evolution then potentially between the appearance of Pineocereus and mesquite, even though you find Pineocereus under other shrubs in the desert, including uh, creosote bush, which, like I said, we didn't have in this area, but it also is found in creosote bushes a lot. So this is why I think mesquite is a very good plant for them. So we decided to test some hypotheses about mesquite's beneficial effects. As I pointed out, because they leafed out, they reduce the light in the summer, and that leads to reduced air temperature and increased humidity. That's kind of, yeah, that's logical. That makes sense. But to test this really logical idea, we use some data loggers made by a company called Onset, and they, they, they have nicknamed their data loggers hobos. So uh, for people that use data loggers, you say, I use a hobo, everybody will know what you're talking about. 
And we measured temperature on 12 data loggers, light intensity on 12, and relative humidity using two of them. These illustrations show the loggers. The little green guys right there measure both temperature and light intensity. And then the big white one here measures uh, relative humidity. We placed the, uh, or we anchored the loggers, as you can see, onto bricks, mostly to prevent the wood rats or pack rats from taking off with them. Then these were placed next to Pitio cereus growing under slightly different conditions. We had eight loggers, which were located beside Pitio cereus growing under mesquites. And we had four loggers that were located next to Pitio cereus that were out in the open. So we had an experimental condition underneath the mesquite, and we had a control condition out in the open. But every single one of the loggers was right beside a Pitio cereus. The data that I'm going to present were um, measured from the 28th of March to the 8th of May in 2013. The loggers were also deployed in uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, but I don't have the data for those years. And I also want to apologize ahead of time. This graph looks a little busy, but there's, we're going to look at these, these things one at a time, these particular attributes them one at a time. So this is the ambient or environmental temperature that's found under the nurse plants, the mesquite, and in the open. Uh, what I want to point out is all you have to do is follow the green dots and the yellow squares. So the green dots indicate the data that came off the loggers that were located under the mesquites, and the yellow squares are the, it will be the data that came off of the um, loggers that were out in the open. So yeah, sure, the temperature varies around, as you can see. But notice that the yellow squares, for the most part, are above the green dots, which says something that everybody would know anyway. It's hotter out in the open than it is under a mesquite. And when you look at the temperatures, there was about, a, if you're looking at Fahrenheit, you notice there's a two degree difference. Out under plants, it was about 75 degrees as an average temperature. And out in the open, it was 77 degrees. When this was subjected to a statistical analysis, this is statistically significantly different. The, the temperature under the mesquites was significantly lower than it was out in the open. Looking at the relative humidity, the, the dots and squares mean the same thing again. And you notice that in this case, the green dots are, for the most part, above the yellow squares. Not by much in a lot of cases, but above it. So the average relative humidity under the mesquites was 18.5%, and the average relative humidity out in the open was 18%. And again, statistically, this ended up being significant. That is, the humidity is higher, statistically significantly higher, under mesquite plants than it was out in the open. With light intensity, light intensity is measured in a unit called lux, which is just roughly the amount of light falling on an area here. Um, and this, again, is nothing surprising, but you'll notice then that out in the open, the light intensity, the yellow squares, is a buttload higher than it is under the plants, under the mesquites. Mesquites are leafed out at this time. They're going to provide shade. And there was a, quite a difference between the two. And again, this was statistically different with much higher light conditions out in the open than under the, the plants. So it's just kind of, a, kind of a confirmation of things that make common sense. So as a nurse plant, mesquite does reduce ambient temperature, which will benefit the pineo cereus growing among it. It increases humidity, which helps reduce evap evapotranspiration in the plants. And it decreases light intensity, which again uh, will help with plants in the summertime when the light is so absolutely intense. They really are very beneficial then for Pediocereus to grow in mesquite than for survival, serving as, uh, you know, so the mesquite is serving as a true nurse plant. Let's move on to flowering then in Pediocereus. This is something it's very well known for. Uh, it is not called queen of the night for nothing. Uh, it is nocturnal. It flowers at night. The flowers then will begin opening up in the early evening, and then they've closed by about 10 o'clock the next day. So a single flower will be open for exactly one night. 
They also have synchronous flowering, which means the plants in a population bloom at the same time. And so this could be quite spectacular in a population of Pinocerius. Particularly in the popular literature, this is often described as being synchronous for a single night. And the other thing is most of the populations in the literature are reported as flowering in June and July. Well, first of all, I want to dispel this myth here about this one night thing. And here's why. You can see this logically in this picture. This is a plant that has a flower on it that is obviously flowering that night, right? You see that? But if you look at this bud here, that bud is three or four days behind that flower. And then there's a third bud down here that is three to four days behind that bud. So we're looking at six to eight days here for just this one plant to have those three flowers bloom. And if you look at any pictures of Pinocerius that are in bud and bloom, you'll see that, that difference. So this is really almost a, a myth that they flower in one night. They flower over a short period of time synchronously, but they don't flower in one night that way. In our population, we estimate from what we saw that they flower for about four to seven nights then, uh, maybe even a little bit longer, could be as long as 10 nights or so. But again, that's a short period of time for all the plants in a population to flower, of the ones that are going to flower. And then out where we are in rodeo, they flowered early May, not in June and July as reported in the literature. So this also is something that varies. Um, I don't know that we, if we just have a, a odd population or if there's something different about the conditions or what it is, but we just have them flowering quite early then out where we are. Um, this is to give you a um, idea of how large the flower is. They're reported as being about two and a half to four inches across. This one was probably closer to four inches across. So they're big flowers. And then the hypanthium, which is the tubular structure, which you've got the petals and, and sepals and stamens located, can be four to six inches high. And I saw that Julie and Greg, our neighbors, are on this talk tonight. So Julie and Greg, those are your feet right there for that plant we all watch together. And... Um, and so they, but I thought that helped give you an idea for size right there. But this being this tall, having a hypanthium that is that long like that, allows the flower then to get above the level of the mesquite then, that it's growing in. And that then will expose the flower better for pollinators. So now we'll move on to pollination here. What pollinates Pidiocerius gregii? Turns out the major pollinator will be the sphinx or hawk moths that are found in the moth family sphingidae. Uh, and these are large moths. Everyone's seen them around porch lights, you know, at various locations. Uh, they do have slightly different food habits because it's a big family. There's a large fat, a lot of moths in it, but they're, they're typical moth appearance, just big. And species that do pollinating have very long proboscis. That is their big tube here that you see here. This is pollinating a saguaro, and then this right here. And the proboscis then is hollow, and they're able to suck up nectar with that, that proboscis. Um, and this makes sense, of course, that the hawk moths or sphinx moths are the pollinators for nocturnal plants like this. They can hover above the flowers like hummingbirds which these two are doing, as you can see there. And they're capable of flying long distances. They're large, strong moths, so they can get long distances between the plants that they pollinate. I have a short video here of a hawk moth pollinating a pediocerious flower. Uh, the picture was taken in Arizona, and I believe this is the other, sub, the other variety then of pediocerious gregii. In a minute, if you watch, you'll see the proboscis as it pulls out. So watch it as it pulls out. See the proboscis over there? Uh, whoop, there it goes. So this has produced a very beautiful Walt Disney type story here, David Attenborough type story. We've got these gorgeous four inch wide white flowers blooming all over the desert at night and these wonderful 
almost nocturnal looking moths that look like hummingbird type things going flower to flower and pollinating, right? This is what it sounds like so far. No, we have observed a sphinx moth one time in rodeo. Um, in fact, it was in that flower where I showed you Julie and Greg's feet, where all of us saw one come flying by the plant like that. There's a good study that's been done in southwestern Arizona by these authors down here, Trumpet Flowers of the Sonoran Desert, Floral Biology of Pineocerus Cacti and the Sacred Datura. And they also were putting a lot of emphasis on what was going on with the flowers in Pineocerus. They spent 168 total hours absorbing blooming Pineocerus flowers out in their three study sites. They had three study sites. And they saw exactly one hawk moth visiting the plants. And they tried to make it a little more specific by saying, oh, we can't possibly have seen all the hawk moths. So they examined all their flowers for the presence of moth scales. And they found them on three open flowers. So out of all that work, and they're talking about hundreds of flowers that they observed, they found four possible bits of evidence that hawk moths visit flowers. They also had very low fruit set in this study, 5 to 25 percent, and that is a very good indication of low pollination. These hawk moths are not doing their job. In rodeo, we have found exactly one fruit in eight years of study there, um, and so we also would have to say that it appears that there's low pollination in our study site, too. Now, there's a possibility that honeybees and beetles work as pollinators. These are beetles then on a flower the day after it's flowered. But you can see what the problem is. The flower has pretty much collapsed and folded up. So if honeybees and beetles do serve as pollinators for these flowers, they probably are not very good. They're probably not very efficient pollinators. They found, the Arizona study also found beetles on their flowers the next day. Uh, and they certainly weren't, they did, were not the pollinator that evolved with these plants. Obviously, what evolved with these plants would be the hawk moths. Suggestions are is that the environment in the southwest of the United States is very fragmented now, so it might make it difficult for moths to find flowers. And then pesticide use of the area, because there's a lot of agricultural work going on there, particularly pecan orchards, chili fields, things like that. And so the extra pesticide use may also be decreasing the, the sphinx moth populations. But it does appear then that these populations are having a very difficult time setting fruit. And since I only have seen one fruit myself out there, I thought I better throw in a picture of fruit so you can see what they do look like, even though they're very rare. They're uh, you know, kind of round, very bright red fruits. They are very... Um, uh, tasty and, and moist. So they probably also have a lot of fruit predators too. A lot of animals would be interested in eating these, everything from pack rats to rabbits to javelinas, anything like that. Uh, and so they, they probably get preyed upon a lot too by animals. So that's, that would be another factor then that would make it very difficult for these plants then to seed themselves in, in the wild. Now, Another feature, uh, I've already pointed about the size of these flowers. These flowers are huge relative to the plant. This is a plant right here that has six flowers on it. These three have already flowered. These three are coming. And counting the hypanthium on them, the, the tube, those flowers are the size of the plant itself. Same thing over here, it's a little harder to see. These are three flowers with big, long hypanthia. They've got the you know, long tube on them. Together, they're almost the size of the plant itself. Well, producing this many flowers that are that big requires a lot of energy from these plants. In addition, the flowers produce huge amounts of nectar, at least compared to what, the, you know, what they've got. Um, they produce about 80 microliters of flower, which is about a third of an ounce of nectar per flower. That's a lot of nectar. And that also requires a lot of energy. Again, in the same study I mentioned before, they measured the amount of nectar that they were finding in the flowers. So that's what they, they figured out. So that means that these plants are expending huge amounts of energy in order to flower in the spring when they do this. So 
my hypothesis is that plants then that flower very profusely are more likely to die after flowering, and plants that don't flower or only produce a few flowers in the spring are more likely to survive. So let's take a look at the data and see what happens with this. Um, I had data for 111 plants that I could use then for this particular hypothesis. And I examined the data to see how many flowers these plants produced in the spring of 2013 and how many produced flowers then in 2015. After then counting the number of flowers, I also then examined the plants in the fall or the following spring after they had flowered and recorded if the plant was alive or dead. So we had 41 of these 111 plants were dead the following fall or spring. They were, they just were, they were just, there was nothing but dead branches on them. And so this late, uh, it's roughly a 37% mortality among this population. That's over a third of the plants died from the time they flowered to the following fall or spring. Looking at a little more specifically, so look at some data on these plants that were dead. So these are plants that were dead following their flowering the previous spring. This was the same 41 right there. 5% of those had not flowered the previous spring. So these are dead plants. And 5% of them did not contribute any flowers at all. But uh, for the other 95% that did flower, they had an average number of flowers of 2.8, almost three flowers per plant. Then I examined of these 111 plants, I looked at the ones that were still alive the following fall and spring, and that's obviously 70. Um, so most, you know, two thirds of the plants were still alive. 51% of them had not bothered flowering the previous spring, and they only had an average number of flowers of 1.4. So these guys up here had spent a lot of energy making flowers. These guys down here had not spent energy making flowers. In fact, slightly over half of them didn't bother making any flowers of, at all. And again, if you subject the, the numbers for the number of flowers by the plants that were dead the following year and the number of flowers for the plants that were alive the following year, these are statistically significantly different numbers. These guys produced statistically more flowers than these guys did. So kind of the take home message is, is that, flowers that, that plants that flower profusely have a lot higher mortality and plants that are more conservative will live to flower again. And it's an interesting strategy then that these plants are using. The question becomes then, did the dead plants really die? And to answer this, we need to look underground. Now, these are both nursery grown plants, but they're the best way to kind of see what's going on underground with Pinaeoceras gregii. These are young plants. You can see they're kind of pencil thin, single stemmed plants coming up here. Um, and this is, these are storage roots on young plants, and this is a storage root on a mature Pinaeoceras gregii. I can tell it's a nursery plant because there is no soil in southwestern New Mexico that looks like this and has perlite in it. So this is a particularly you know, good root that you're looking at here, but this is what happens with them out in the wild too. So they have these large storage roots that are down in that hard soil that's, that we find, and this structure is very moist, it's woody, and actually it can be chewed on or eaten as a water source if needed because it is wet. It, it, it's, it's holding water. It's basically storing water more than anything else. So the above ground plant will die, but the storage root survives. And then the above ground plant can just regrow from the root. So the plant dies and then regrows again. The root obviously persists. It's there in the soil, but I have not seen anyone that has given, given any indication in the literature if they know how long these things last. And the plant then almost appears to resurrect itself after death. You think you've got a dead plant in front of you, and sometime later, suddenly it's growing again. And that's all because of the ability of these storage roots to regrow the above ground plant. So, I've got a current study going on on the growth rate of these new above ground plants. 
Um, I have a group of tagged plants that I can watch on a pretty regular basis. And this is just the data from one plant. So I want to point out what kind of what we're looking at here. On the 2nd of December in 2019, the plant was dead. It was very, very dead. Then um, I noticed then on the, the 20th of April, the following year, that there were two small branches coming up out of the ground. This is a live branch here. Whoops, sorry about that. Let me see if I can back up again here. Um, yeah, okay. And here's another one right there. So there's one branch, and this is one branch. The stems here are all dead, the, the dead, quote, dead plant that was there. So I measured those stems on the 8th of May, and then I measured those stems again just this past fall then on the 29th of October. And this is what the plant looks like now just last week when we were down there. So it went from these two little stems here um, on the 20th of April then to about a year later looking like a full-grown, full-fledged plant. In fact, you can even notice there are two little flower buds coming right there, one right there and one right there. So since I had data on growth for two other dates, for the 8th of May 2020 and for the 29th of October 2020, I can get an idea of the growth rate of these two stems. Obviously, stem number one is the shorter one here, and stem number two is a taller one. But between the two of them, they're growing at a rate of about 1 to 1.5 centimeters per month, which is about a half an inch a month. And you notice that we have measured them from a winter when it was dead to the following spring to the following fall. And there's been pretty steady growth on both of those branches through that time period, indicating that this plant is growing year round. It's not just growing in the summertime or in the spring when it's warm, but it's also able to grow in the winter. In addition, if you remember, we did not have um, monsoons last summer. So between May and October, it really would not have received a huge amount of rain, yet it, both the stems were showing a pretty steady growth during that time. So this plant appears to be able to rely almost entirely on the, the store of water in that storage route to be able to resurrect itself and grow back up again. And now Within um, two years, this plant is ready to flower again. And if you know anything about growth of plants in the desert, that's an amazing growth rate. That is just not something that happens in desert plants very often. I'll have more than one plant for data probably in a couple of years. But for right now, I just showed you the data for that plant because that was what I had, had, I had the data for. So kind of an in conclusion here. There doesn't appear to be any population recruitment by a seed germination, um, at least in the study area down to rodeo. And pollination is a scarce event. It doesn't happen very often. And when it does, when the fruits develop, they appear to be eaten by predators. Now, the, the seeds are very tiny little black things. And there's a chance then that the seeds pass through the gut of the predators and are distributed around the environment. And that's a very common way for plants to spread themselves, especially if it's a plant making tasty fruit, it often has seeds that can be scattered by predators. So even if the fruits are eaten, the seeds actually should get scattered around some. In this population, it appears that it, the population is being maintained just by regrowth, though, from storage roots. And I would have to say that the lack of seed production, both in our population down um, in Hidalgo County, and from the sounds of it, the populations that were studied in Arizona, that lack of seed production is more of a threat to the species than collecting is. Uh, Pinaceous gray guy is very easy to grow uh, in captivity, so to speak. So there's no need for collecting, and I don't believe that collecting is a big threat to the plants so much anymore. But lack of seed product production very much can be. Climate change is also going to factor in here because it's going to threaten the root survival. As the conditions become drier, the storage roots aren't going to be able to hold the water. Uh, the um, Pideoceris, at least in this area, in our study area, appears to have higher survival rates in mesquite than under other nurse plants or out in the open. 
So that means that mesquite removal should be discouraged in areas with large Pinyaceris uh, gregii populations because mesquite appears to be really important for preserving this particular species. And then frankly, and maybe this might be the most, one of the most important things, is that efforts should be made to protect hawk buff populations uh, by reducing fragmented habitats and by reducing pesticide use, both which will be very, very difficult to do. And I'd have to say with that, I've pretty well finished off what I had to say. And I think Don said he was going to look for questions in the chat feature for me and let me know if there were some questions. Yeah, okay. well, do you want me to Thank you very much, Beth. Um, <laughs> that was that was excellent, and we've got like eight hours of questions, so we should probably get going right now. I'm wondering, Beth, if you might unshare so we can see okay. everybody, yeah. everybody in the audience. Uh, I am trying work. I'm working on it. Just a minute. I'm getting there. It is. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. Um, let me get the chat back. Okay, we're going to get the chat back. So um, what about nitro nitrogen fixation by the mesquite as, you know, uh, nurse plant? Right. right. That's a good question. I've never seen anything about it in the literature, and we haven't done anything with it. I mean, in terms of, I mean, it should add more nutrients, nitrogen, into the soil. Right. But that might be another factor on why uh, mesquite would be an inc incredibly good nurse plant for it. Too. Beth? Yeah. Uh, young mesquites are probably do nitrogen fixation, but as soon as they get any size, any accumulation of nitrogen would stop nitrogen fixation. Oh, that okay. makes it, that's, the bacteria that's only add, work that's if there's no that's nitrogen. Add to, that's add on my computer, so that's add uh -huh. something that. Yes, it just looks like Beth-like. <laughs> We could tell it was Ed. We, we, <laughs> we knew it was you, Ed. What about bat pollinators? No, not on Pity or Sirius. None of them have been reported. I, I figured that was going to be asked. Of course, the, the uh, saguaros very commonly have bat pollinators. Now, they have never been observed. Does that mean they don't happen? Probably not, but they have never been observed. I fell asleep on the road out there. there. Tell Ed to shut his, my computer down. <laughs> So Chris Jesperson has a, a, a question about, I think you may, might have answered that, but don't the seeds spread when the fruits are eaten? Why is producing? Yes, and I, I mentioned that at the, at the end, that that kind of confounds the argument that all the fruits are disappearing, because um, it's very apparent that, the, you know, fruits advertise themselves. They advertise themselves to be eaten by animals, and usually fruits that advertise themselves like that have seeds that will survive going through a gut. And so there's a very good chance that these should, should be seeds that survive going through a gut. Okay. But we've never seen any young plants in our study area. Not at all. Um, how frequently do mass flowering, mass flowerings occur? Uh, as far as I know, in our population, we have them only happen once, but other places, particularly in Arizona, they've had them, ha they have them happen maybe even two or three times a season. They happen every year. They're definitely annual. You know, have you ever tried um, artificial pollination just by um, disturbing the flower uh, just to... Oh, with the paintbrush? Yeah, no, we, we've, we've discussed it. We just like haven't done it. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It kind of hasn't been the purpose of this study because that's right. interfering. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, believe me, we have very much thought about doing that. The reason I was asking is because it would be fun if you could, um, if you could artificially pollinate one and, and produce seed and then study how much scarification is needed in order for... Um, germination to occur well we did the once the one fruit we found we did collect the seeds from it and we're in the process of yeah you know, checking all that out now with that one little batch of seeds fun if you need a technician i'd love to be one ah thank you <clears throat> might take you up on that i i'm curious about um okay andy go ahead 
Yeah, that was a fascinating thing. Uh, why are why do they consider these plants a threat from collection? I mean, who wants to collect a plant, plant it in your yard that blooms at night when you're asleep? <laughs> I, I, that would not would not have been the question I would have said. I would have said, who would want to collect that plant because they're so darn ugly? They're really <laughs> ugly. Um, they, there's just nothing to them. They, but they have they have been collected in the past. All, almost all cactus species that are anything outside of a toy or a prickly pear has had problems in the past with collection, collecting. Um, many cacti, if not most of them, are now being grown very easily by seed. People know what they're doing now. You go to a place like Boyce Thompson Arboretum and they have their great spring sale and you can go get almost every cactus species you want that's been grown in a nursery. And those plants are pretty, they're nicer, they're used to being in a pot. Um, the night blooming thing is a big thing. First of all, they do start blooming early in the evening. You aren't in bed already yet. You're, you, you've got a chance to see them. Many cases, especially if there are a lot of flowers, they're very fragrant. And um, there's a, I, I learned this while I was you know, putting these slides together. There's a place over in Tucson. It's a privately owned arboretum that specializes in Pineocereus. And on the nights when they bloom, they have literally thousands of people there watching these plants bloom and, um, you know, enjoying them. But I don't think collecting is a problem anymore, Andy. I really don't. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Chris, Jessen, I'm going to go to you just in a second. But just a little follow-up here. You know, there are people that are just nuts about orchids, and there are people mm -hmm. who are nuts about Cactus. anything that's, that's right. Yeah. rare. That's right. So that is always a they, potentially is always a problem. So I'm just wondering, you know, I know Ed does a lot of work with, with cacti, obviously, you know, that's his thing. And um, if, if a person wanted to propagate this particular cactus, is that something that can be done? That should relieve some of that collection pressure. And I want um, to <laughs> Good. Huh? And I want to be the technician. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know if Ed was listening enough to hear what the question was. Um, I, I do know that I'm pretty sure they can also be propagated by cuttings. Mm -hmm. But as I understand, the seeds germinate fairly well. That, mm -hmm. you know, so that, if again, if you can get the fruits. And, and in places where they're more protected, um, you know, I think the fruit set is much better. We're looking at a wild population that's under a lot of pressure and a very, very, you know, very rough habitat. Uh, and so, you again, you grow them in a nice arboretum somewhere, you'll probably get the fruits and be able to propagate them. And most of the sales, in fact, just from uh, checking websites for this talk, there are a lot of nurseries that sell them, that raise them themselves and sell them now. Okay, Chris. Well, I wanted to respond to Andy by saying that we inherited a couple of different serious plants, or at least that's what we've identified them as, um, from Melanie Shafari. I think you might have known her through the UU. And I've actually been able to cut them and start new plants. But the magic of the flower is so amazing. Like I did not know that eventually we were going to get these. We had the plant for several years before we saw the first. And then all of a sudden we go out there in the morning and there is this burst of a flower. And now we've had several times that it is magical. So just know that it's a pretty fun plant, even if it's not really very pretty most of the time. And it doesn't yeah, look <laughs> it's really impressive in the wild to, to see this happening too. You're looking at the hillside going, oh, there's one, there's one, there's one, you know, because you can see the flowers. I just want to say, Chris, they've been probably were blooming for years and you didn't know it because you were sleeping. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I think we'd always notice it in the morning though, but you're right. That's possible. <laughs> but you don't have to be up at midnight. Our they're, they're pretty much full bloom by 10 o'clock at night, and you can't see them in the morning, the next morning. Go ahead, Ryan. There are some of them that don't sleep well, too. <laughs> <laughs> and you wander around your yard at night. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> for flowers. 
Other questions? This is great. Uh, I see a question from Donna Stevens. Um, do Pina Sirius have any medicinal qualities? Uh, yeah, I decided not to cover that, uh, but they have been used for anything and everything, you know, it, as far as traditional uses go. Uh, they, another paper that I read was a analysis, an anatomical um, uh, analysis of that root. It's wood and water. That's it. And so uh, the root has been, has been what people have generally used medicinally. But it really doesn't have any biochemical or physiological properties. So it's been used for heart problems, diabetes, uh, nerve issues, um, probably probably as a diet pill, unlikely, you know, just so, but there it has it has nothing in it that would in any way support that it could be used medicinally. One of the things I often think about is um, having a garden that's specifically for night pollinators or having a, an assemblage of plants that's for night pollinators. And I think of when we were in Minnesota, this was not a native plant, but, uh, you know, Nicotiniana. Yeah. It was just these hawk moths would just come in and the fragrance was so wonderful. And uh, so... And anyway, I'm just thinking about a, a night pollinator garden. Any other questions? <clears throat> Beth, this is Jim. Um, yeah, hi, Jim. What about ants? Have you ever seen ants on the flowers? Uh, yeah, and of course, being near mesquites and the you know, mesquites being a very much ant attractants. Um, I had to try to think back because we didn't actually record whether or not I've seen ants on them. I'm going to put it this way. I can't believe that ants are not on them. But I think it would generally be that next morning after those flowers have died quite a bit. So I don't know how efficient pollinator they would be either. I thought about that too while I was putting this together. I thought, gosh, I don't remember seeing any, but I can't believe they aren't there. Okay, thanks. So I didn't really, I wasn't able to answer your question very well because of that. Yeah. Other questions? Well, <laughs> so we'll, we'll cut it off at that. I'd like to thank Beth. That was absolutely excellent. And uh, I think we all know much more about how science works. Mm -hmm. and much more about uh, this uh, Pinocerium plant. Um, so I'd like to uh, invite you all to uh, come back in, on April 29th for our trivia night, joint Audubon GNPS, that's a new deal. And then in May, we're going to learn, learn about liverworts. Where else do you get the chance? Come on. And, uh, <laughs> So thank you all very much. And uh, please do get onto our Facebook page, Healing Native Plant Society, and like us.